Okay, so for completeness of the video, um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are in the seventh week of the Open Seed um, mentoring program, and today we are going to have a call on open leadership in practice. This call is specifically for the Catalyst um, track, but members of the DRI are very much welcome and we would like to hear also from them. As usual, we have a code of conduct that applies to this call and every other space that um, OLS holds. If you experience any unacceptable behavior, please report that by sending an email to teams at weareols.org or by reporting to individual organizer at Barry's, uh, Malvika, you or myself, both of us, the name at OLS at weareols.org. We are most likely not going to have breakout rooms. Uh, so I would skip that part. But if for whatever reason we have breakout room, I would um, request that you add a W for writing, S dash E for English speaking, S dash F R for French, and then S dash E S for Spanish. With that, I would welcome everyone and um, this is a bit different from what we have in previous calls, um, previous cohorts in terms of what we do with the open leadership um, session. The reason we are having a difference is to make sure that we have more time with the representatives from the pro project team of the Catalyst. The Catalyst project has seven organizations. Um, I will start with OLS. OLS, uh, we have to I2C, we have IOI, we have um, CICAD, we have the Carpentries, and then we have Metro Desensia and CSCCE. Unfortunately, we do not have a representative from Metro Desensia and CSCCE because they have other conflicting engagement that we could not have their representative. So I do have a bit of slide just to introduce everyone to where we are in the program. And I will share my screen if in a bit. Okay, so we are in the seventh week, and this is open leadership in practice. In the journey of the open seed, we are currently in week seven. And then next week, we are going to have community cafe, community management cafe, which is open to everyone. What do we intend to learn out of today's session? Uh, so we want to learn from different leaders in the open science space and about their different leadership skills and then their different journeys. What that will help us do is get some ideas of non-traditional academic career paths and then appreciate different leadership styles. Um, if you have an interest to know more or see other uh, open leadership uh, calls that we have, if you click on this link, it will show you the different ones that we have over the years. And you can have other interesting talks that were presented. So with that, I will uh, stop sharing and then go to the notes uh, in a moment. In line 77, yes. So we have five panelists with us and I will call them to introduce themselves. While introducing yourself, kindly tell us about your open leadership journey that brings you to the Catalyst project. I'm going to paste the question in the chat. I think that would be helpful. So tell us about your open leadership journey that brought you to the Catalyst project. Also tell us about your role and your organizational role in the Catalyst and broadly in the open science um, ecosystem. So the first person I have on the list is Angelique who is from the Carpentries. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Taj. Uh, my name is Edgy Trassler, and I am based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend the session last week and tell you a bit more about the Carpentries, those of you who were there. But um, I love telling the story of how I got involved in the Carpentries and furthermore, open science and uh, uh, then 
my leadership role, I want to say how that kind of blossomed out of that. So I come from a behavioral science background. I have a PhD in educational psychology, but from my master's degree, I had a great interest in quantitative methodologies. And I wanted to understand, you know, how to mathematically, coming from a travel agent, right? No, I'm just kidding. I wanted to mathematically model a social ecology. And if you think about um, a social ecology in social science terms, it's just all the different parts are coming together and how we model that. But in South Africa, and I can't speak for the rest of the continent, we don't have statistics or quantitative methods as part of our curriculum. So I had to go and look for this. I had to go reach out and I had to um, ask supervisors and people and I had to take extra stuff. And it, it was it was a daunting task because I'm speaking to people who don't necessarily believe that social scientists need to do quantitative methods. And um, it was an uphill battle until I found the great supervisor and introduced me to the Northwest University. Um, they had a, they call it e-research, but it's not electronic research, it's enabling research, but open science movement. And this is where I got the opportunity to get to know the carpentries. And those of you who don't know about the carbon trees, we teach open science, um, data science, programming, um, I want to say curricula using open source software to researchers globally, right? And then um, also by doing so, we teach instructors how to teach these curricula using uh, educational psychology pedagogy, which is right up my alley. And... Um, I recall being trained in Cape Town, South Africa, by a bunch of my now colleagues at the Carpentries. And I went back and it was the greatest thing to bring this pedagogy and teach quantitative methods, um, specifically R and R Studio, to the people in my um uh, I want to say my research group and how we grew and study groups grew out of that. And the more I got to do that, the more I wanted to have to do with that, right? And I was in academia and writing papers, and it was great, but I wanted more the whole time. And I felt like I have a bigger purpose in life. And one day, someone sent me a um, – I was then working in, in a private sector in South Africa, and I left academia. Um, and they sent me a job posting at the Carpentries for a regional consultant for Southern Africa. So they saw the need in Africa for someone based on the continent, and they wanted to get someone in the Carpentries knowledgeable about educational psychology and knowledgeable about a research method. And I almost want to say the rest is history, but I feel the 1st of November, I'm five years with the Carpentries, and my role kind of, you know, yes, so as well, the role kind of evolved. I... Uh, was a contractor and then Africa capacity developer manager, now community manager at the Carpentries. So it, it blossomed from Southern Africa to the continent. And now um, with the recent shifts we had in our staffing, we uh, it became community manager. Uh, my role at the Catalyst is, uh, it's a very interesting one. And I feel the last five years has prepared me for it with the carpentries working on ground level with our community members, I built up, uh, I want to say a toolkit of uh, connections and networks. And when we started working at uh, thinking about recruiting African, specifically health sciences, biohealth sciences, communities, I could jump in and reach out and say, let's talk about this. I want to bring this infrastructure to you. And then I met Taj and it was great because Taj was just around, well, in, Africa sense around the corner from me. Um, we kind of share similar time zones and it was great to meet someone in the Catalyst Project, also from the continent. And we can share stories about the weather and sports and things. It was always very nice. And Africans have that in common. We always have to complain about the weather. Well, this African has to, I think. Um, and the broader ecosystem, I, I really feel I truly try and live the values that's in open leadership and open science. And that also speaks to the carpentries. I want to make things accessible to people. I want to make it equitable. I want to include diversity. We have to see, coming from the global south, there's so much wrong, but things 
can go so right when we have the right people talking and open source software is one of them. Open science, the a fair principles, I can go on and on and on, right? I feel like the road's only beginning, even though my path is probably like, you know, it's like a marathon. You can't see the end yet, but I'm not at the start. So um, yeah, I don't know if I went off on a tangent. I hope I shared that, but I love telling the story. One more story. I taught a carpentry's workshop in R. And those of you who are familiar with R know you can create variables in the global environment, it pops up. And um, there was a learner sitting there one day and we were creating, just assigning the value two to the letter X. And it turned around and the individual said, what black magic is this? And I had the greatest chuckle because it's magic. We are teaching magic and we're giving them these magic potions kind of to go and do their own research. And I hope I, I can share some of the magic with you today, right? Uh, thank you very much, Angelique. That was really interesting. Um, next we have Jim from Dwight Twisten. Great, so hi everyone. My name is Jim Coliander. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the Northwest corner of the United States in Washington state. Uh, so I started my career as a math professor after being a postdoc at Berkeley. And I pretty much stayed in my lane and did research mathematics for quite some time. Uh, and I adore theorem. I like the prime numbers, just like Taj was saying off the top. Uh, but in 2012, I had this idea that grading student exams was a real pain and organizing teams of graduate students to work with me to grade lots and lots of paper was a real pain. So I had this idea that there should be a web app that would allow for improved grading. And I brought that idea forward to my colleagues in the tech transfer office at the University of Toronto, where I was a professor, and they encouraged me to create a company. And so I learned how to be an entrepreneur by spinning out an education technology company um, called Crowdmark. And I served as the CEO and founder of that for about six years until my life got a little complex and the company got to the stage where it was no longer a good idea to have a professor type leading a business. But along the way, I saw that ideas around digital technology education and collaboration were really sparkly. There were opportunities for um, ideas to impact people beyond the, the audience that can see a chalkboard because of the way that digital technology can connect us. Um, and so I began to be interested in communications that go beyond my role as a math professor. And so I started um, trying to in, trying to change some policy in Canada and the United States related to science through blogging and writing. And eventually I came to uh, see the potential for improvements around the management of data and coding and storytelling using this transformational technology called Jupiter. And in 2016, I became the director of a math institute based at the University of British Columbia. And one of the things that I did in that role was run an experiment to use the cloud to make this Jupiter technology available across the nation of Canada. And now there's about 75,000 people that use that network. Uh, but while doing that, I recognized that there was no sustainability model. There was no business. There was no way to keep the lights on. And the person that was actually doing the technical work was not getting paid for that technical work, but was doing it on the side of his desk. His name was Ian Allison and I think the world of Ian. So I began to see that there needed to be some kind of a company that could deliver these types of services with mission, vision, values, alignment to what I perceive to be the university or the academic mission of education and research. And so with conversations with some other really spectacular people, I'll probably name drop later, we formed the International Interactive Computing Collaboration or 2i2c.org. 
And through that, I've had an opportunity to interact with a lot more folks working in open science. I served on the community panel advising the NASA TOPS mission for three years. So I helped to try to shape and influence the way the United States federal government is thinking about open science and uh, you know, have spent time reading and thinking about the UNESCO call and so forth. So that's kind of my arc, and I'll look forward to sharing other threads that I kind of foreshadowed there in subsequent responses. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Um, should I ask if you can talk a little bit about the role of um, I2C in the project, in the Catalyst project? Sure. So uh, <clears throat> 2I2C... Uh, is currently led by our executive director, Chris Holdgraf, who uh, wrote the first draft of the grant that went to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to seek funding for the Catalyst project. And 2I2C is serving as, I think, kind of the, let's say, the central node for the partners that are working together to try to catalyze research and open science communities in Latin America and Africa. Um, our role, uh, our key role in the project, I believe, is to make the infrastructure uh, that's technical and some social infrastructure to facilitate these research communities to use technology for interacting with code and data in a collaborative open way through the browser. Our long-term goal, and this I think is one of the main goals that I would like to have happen before the end of the year, our long-term goal is to be a supporter instead of a leader. So I would like to be available to assist scientists in Africa, uh, scientists in Latin America that have seen the potential for what we are prototyping with um, the Catalyst project. and to assist authentic leadership from Africa and Latin America to build funding and maintain communities, scholars working together collaboratively um, to address the challenges as uh, seen by those future leaders. Uh, so we at 2I2C, I think, tried to catalyze in partnership with others on this panel, um, the emergence of some communities that through self-governance and uh, local leadership, I hope can lead to really vibrant, outstanding uh, research and teaching communities in the future. Um, thank you very much, Jim. Um, next we have Katrin, so I'm going in alphabetical order. Sure. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm Catherine Skinner. I currently serve as the Director of Programs at uh, Invest in Open Infrastructure. And my leadership journey really started, I'll do kind of like uh, Angelique can go back to kind of graduate school and how, how I pivoted. Uh, I was a sociologist by training. So I was in the process of uh, earning my PhD uh, and the questions that I was asking were about changes in the music industry. Um, so this was around 99, 2000. And uh, I was really interested in the ways, yeah, exactly, the ways that the, the whole infrastructure of the music industry, which had been so uh, carefully constructed over so many years, was upended almost overnight um, by Napster and other uh, factors out there. Um, and upended in both positive and negative ways, but in ways that did dramatically change that industry. Um, and so I got a side job. Be careful about your side jobs. My side job was in the library. I was project managing for the director of library systems, who was also getting his PhD through the same program I was at the time. So he was he was raising children, he was writing his dissertation, and he was running a, a division of the library and landing grants. Um, he was a bit of an overachiever, but he uh, he hired me to work on two Mellon grants 
that he had just landed that were related to archival sharing and explicitly using OAI PMH, which is a particular protocol to share archival collections. Um, for about six months, it was a joke. Uh, I wasn't, you know, enticed. I wasn't, uh, I didn't see the connections. And then all of a sudden, I remember waking up one day and like, not literally waking up, but like suddenly coming to the realization that everything that I was studying about the music industry was happening to the academic industry and nobody was paying attention. This is before Google had launched. This is, you know, it, it's right before all of that stuff was happening. Amazon and Yahoo were competitors with the library and the library wasn't recognizing them as such. Um, and so I got really interested in open information and what it meant that our information was starting to be commodified in this new supposedly super open technology of the internet. Um, I went on to found a nonprofit called the Educopia Institute. Uh, they are still out there running healthily and wonderfully under three co-directors. Um, Educopia, I ran for 16 years to build communities within the library, publishing, and uh, kind of academic uh, scholarly communication space. Uh, we worked on a lot of significant projects. We wound up fiscally hosting a number of programs. Um, and so I was kind of steeped in open access, open, certainly open source, um, and a little bit of open science, not a lot, but a bit of open science around the edges. Most of the work that we were doing was social sciences and humanities based, or was in close coordination with the libraries, or maybe with the university presses. Um, the work that I did at Educopia was very much about taking the social movement, because part of what I learned in my PhD work was social movements are one of the big ways that industry change happens. Um, and I knew that, but I, I really knew it after I had dug into it in my dissertation research. Um, and so I used a lot of social movement uh, kind of techniques and characteristics in the way we ran our communities from Educopia. So first, like I would have cringed at the idea of running a community. I didn't actually run any communities, but I facilitated and Educopia served as a facilitator. So we weren't there to own or control or do anything else. We were there really to empower and to build um, in, in connection with these, uh, you know, again, mostly library archives, publisher communities. Um, it was so much fun. I loved my job. I loved my company. Uh, I built it for 16 years and it was around year 10 that I realized that one of the things that I was telling other communities, including the ones that were uh, hosted by Educopia, was that one of the biggest dangers that people don't pay attention to is that leadership stagnates. It doesn't matter how good or bad the leader is, they stagnate, period. And if a leader stays in one position for too long, the, the kind of uh, personality-driven aspects of the business, it, they're just very, very hard to avoid. And so one of the markers of healthy communities is that their founders get the hell out of the way. Um, and so, yeah, I spent five years getting things to the point where I felt like I could responsibly step away from what was by that time, a 16 person enterprise, um, and did it successfully. They're still running. It's three years later. Uh, they're running beautifully. They're running better than they were when I was there. Um, lots of new blood and energy and wonderful things happening at Educopia pivoted uh, and came back to research because I'd been shouldering the executive functions for a nonprofit for 16 years, which is stressful in its own way, especially when you come into it by accident, which was, I, I didn't mean to found a 501c3, a nonprofit, um, but it kind of happened. And then I had to figure out payroll and I had to figure out how to file this, that, and the other. And we were heavily grant funded. So I had to figure out federal grants and uh, foundation grants and figure out business plan and all the other things that I know Jim uh, also had to do, not on the nonprofit side, but still also had to do. Um, 
it was heavy to know that there were 16 other lives and all of these communities that were kind of dependent on what decisions I was making. So I knew I didn't want another executive position until my kids are grown. Um, I've got two teenagers and I can't run a business and take care of them the way that I want to. So I was like, research, let's go back to research. And that landed me at Invest in Open Infrastructure, which I had helped to found from where I was at Educopia about five years before, or about three years before. They just happened to have a job pop open. And that is how I kind of meandered my way into more open science work, uh, a lot of uh, engagement with, you know, certainly kind of the Jupiter communities and all of the different ways that those manifest, but especially 2I2C. Um, and I'm still getting like, this is, I'm in some ways still getting my feet underneath me in open science, uh, even after what has been, I think, a, a pretty good career in open access, open source, open, you know, other open scholarship, um, which has been both humbling and really, really powerful uh, and working in these networks and really starting to see the different ways that knowledge dissemination gets trapped in certain geographical regions and how much harm it does to all geographical regions and to all people when that happens and to see how quickly the world is shifting. I mean, I'm sure most of you just saw the news from Spain where we're seeing yet another flood like Nigeria, like, I mean, it, it's, we're, we're at a stage where information better be flowing fast and it better be flowing without constraints that damage uh, the overall set of players that can come into it. So it has been a pleasure and uh, you know a passion to work in the Catalyst Project where this is trying to open up more technologies that right now have too many barriers to entry uh, to a lot of scholars, a lot of players, a lot of practitioners who don't have it uh, unless there are pathways like this carved out for it. Um, thank you very much, Katrin. Um, so I had a bit of a network uh, glitch. I'm not sure if you mentioned more about the role of IOI in the project. Sorry, and IOI's role in the project is around governance, uh, really thinking through what, you know, again, these community functions, what role should the uh, community partners have in the sustaining and direction of Catalyst long-term if this continues to live and what types of engagement are fair to ask of folks who are ultimately piloting this with us right now. So the, the kind of balancing act that IOI has played is we've, we've been talking to all community partners. We've been talking also to all of the partners uh, that are part of the, um, the kind of hub of the grant uh, and trying to negotiate that space of we all want to see this continue. We all know that we're going to work towards that and are hoping that that's going to be the case. We also all know that putting undue pressure on community partners to construct a governance model is a bit cart before horse if it happens right now. Um, and so finding ways to empower voices, put more control in community partner hands, um, particularly for whatever projects come next or how this does continue, has to be balanced with not uh, providing extra work for community members to need to do in order to be a part of the project. So that's that's IOI's role kind of in a nutshell. Uh, and I've been joined by uh, Lauren Collister uh, for a bit of the journey recently. And we're all enjoying getting to know the community partners, both through the, the conversations that we've had with you as interviews, and then also through hosting uh, a series of community conversations right now. Sorry, I should have should have foregrounded that, Taj. Thank you, thank you. Um, next is Nicholas. Uh, hi everybody. I'm uh, I'm from Argentina, uh, the country that is very very south in the world. Uh, very safe country when the when the nukes will come, when the atomic war <laughs> will come. 
uh, I'm, I'm happy with, with, with my location sometimes. It's difficult to arrive to everywhere because we are far, far away, but, but it is safe. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a computer boy. I was, I was really, um, I was really happy when I had my first computer. It was when, when I was eight, nine, ten years old. Just, just got caught by that. I, I thank a lot to, to the cheap computers when I was a kid because without that I couldn't have uh, known the that uh, miraculous machine, and uh, and I just got. Uh, studying computer science and I got a PhD but but I was very old at that time I, I started my PhD as an old guy and I did something like an intersection between mathematics and computer science uh, it was really difficult for me to to concentrate on those topics uh, having two children so I decided to, to, to go back to my passion that was hardware. I love hardware. I love uh, the, the iron, the, the, the iron solder. I love to do electronics. So I went to, no, I'm, 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 I'm 50, 50 years old. Um, I will forgive you then. <laughs> Um, I finished more or less at that age, <laughs> yo. Um, so um, I started to do HPC, um, like like high, high performance computing, and I, in that process, I started to help with our HPC in, in my university. That that is the oldest university in Argentina and the second oldest in in all America. America, I mean whole America and uh, uh, well uh, at some point I, I, I was uh, I was elected like a director of that HPC center but I continue doing exactly the same thing I'm, I'm not a leader I'm just the employee of, of, of the technical people because I, I just try to get them money and and hardware to, to build things and at that point I understood that uh, computer power is key for people uh, in many in many ways and we started to generate demand there was no demand for for HPC and we knew that that if if we showed the people the right tools and help them a little bit they could do a lot of things and uh, that's what that 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 was uh, what I'm trying to do all the time I'm, I'm, I'm trying to generate demand and to satisfy demand in computing. And when um, Laura Sion told me about this project, I was really uh, cocked because interactive computing is, is that. There is a lot of demand in computing that is a little bit more than a laptop, but much less than a cluster. So, so this, at that point is, for me, is very interesting because this is a whole bunch of, of computing that, that people need. So I'm here because of that. And I, and I do believe that uh, the 2 to c model is marvelous. But uh, we have a problem that we don't have dollars. So when you have, we don't have a continuous fee, uh, feed of dollars. So when you have some dollars, the best thing that you can do is to buy a computer and, and rack them in a in a very locked uh, in, in a very locked um, place, so nobody can take it away. Uh, that's why we are trying to build, uh, trying to do the, the same as try to see, but but local. Um, so that's why we are in 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 this project, in the Catalyst project. So this is our our aim to to satisfy the interactive computing needs needs of the people, uh, but with running in 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 local iron. Um, thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, then we go to you before we open the questions. 
I have enjoyed listening to all of you for so for yeah for so so much um and actually a lot of the things that you all have been saying have been echoing my brain to the point where I had to take notes and I'm gonna have to reference that for example Catherine I'm so glad to hear that there are other people who accidentally co-founded a not-for-profit whilst doing grad school <laughs> Um, and Jim, uh, likewise, um, wait, am I academic or am I an entrepreneur? And suddenly figuring out, like, how to give your staff pensions. And, um, but I thought I was just supposed to be writing papers. No, 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 none of that. <laughs> so a lot of the introductory speech really, really spoke to me. Um, also, Nico, uh, actually, I don't know if you could shorten yours to Nico, if it's always Nicolas, uh, apologies. Um, 38 isn't old. I say this because it's the only way I can self-affirm that having passed that age, I'm not old yet, right? Look, can't be old. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, to actually talk about my career path beyond just saying I've enjoyed everyone else's stories, um, I came to academia very, very backwards. Uh, so by the time I graduated, I was nearly 40. Uh, when I said graduated, that was graduated my doctorate. Uh, but before that, um, I hadn't even finished my bachelor's. I was when I started working at the University of Cambridge in a research group as a research software engineer. And I sort of realized there was nowhere else for me to go. Um, so I should probably get some more of the degrees that make people think that you're competent, uh, which is annoying because it's also not the way that I would want anyone else to be treated. But I kind of felt like there was no way that I could have any further career progression at a university without that doctorate. Um, and then by the time I'd finished my doctorate, I was running a not-for-profit. Um, so I did my um, undergraduate and my um, doctoral degree in computer science, um, which is why, of course, I did mostly qualitative and human oriented methods rather than any code to speak of and probably have plenty to learn from Angelique and Catherine in terms of methods used, etc. Uh, but what I super cared about when I was working at Cambridge as a software engineer was the people who did the software. Um, because I was, I was working on an open source biological data warehouse um, And I was doing what uh, we mostly call front end, which is to say that I did the bits that people clicked on and interacted with when I was writing code for scientists. Um, and I was curious what made people interact in the ways that they do. Um, and hence, a lot of my research was around communities and around things like usability. Uh, and along the way, I had a full-time job, I was doing a doctorate part-time as well, and I said I definitely, definitely don't have time to do this Mozilla open leadership thing where they're trying to launch leadership programs. But then I said, but what if your research was related to it? And I managed to talk myself into uh, collaborating with Movika Sharan, Bernice Batu, um, and later also Emmy Tsang, who works at IOI these days. Um, And we said, let's train people around open science and the community stuff that we've learned when we were just sort of, you know, figuring it out on our own. But let's make it easier for people and let's share what we know rather than just letting other people try and figure it out on their own. Um, and that was in 2019. Fast forward, we're at the end of 2024 and something that started as an open science training thing that we, you know, we thought would be fun. has actually become um, a not-for-profit that's dedicated towards helping people uh, share their work. Um, and when I say science, I, I also mean research, I also mean scholarship, with um, whether or not you're associated with academia, because I think that one thing that um, I've probably already alluded to is that academia is very good at telling people they're not good enough and that they don't fit in, unfortunately. Um, and so OLS, we have community members from whether you have a doctorate, whether you have a master's, whether you have a bachelor's, or maybe none of the above, but you do research, then we're interested in talking with you, working with you, and learning what you do when you collaborate, and maybe sharing the good practices that we do. Um, so I think my, my um, 
talk here has been very wiggly and definitely not back to front. <laughs> Sorry, definitely not uh, front to end. Uh, but I hope sort of I've been able to share some of the passions and the things that I care about. Um, and the reason that we're here today um, as part of the OLS project um, is very much because we care about communities and we are reasonably proud of our global reach. So I think OLS has people um, from 60 or more countries in the community. And so we were hoping that we could share some of the community knowledge uh, as um, part of our uh, participation and catalyst. So this program, the reason you're on the call today is that we do interacting with humans and we like to share it. I feel like I should be more articulate if I claim that I know about interacting with humans, but this is where we're at. Uh, Taj, did I answer your questions? Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. So that's the first part, general introduction. I have some pre questions that I would want to start with. So I'm going to paste the question in the chat, and then I'm also going to add that to the document. So most of the projects we have on the Catalyst and DRI track are partly in terms of building communities. And then definitely there is a thought on governance and leadership. So like thinking about your different organizations, why is leadership or governance important? How do you create one? And then is there a difference between a more technical organization like Y2C compared to one that interacts with humans like OLS in terms of how you structure governance? Um, we don't, I, I would like to give that open to anyone that wants to answer the question without pointing. Um, yes, please, Anjali. Thanks, Taj. I think um, this is a great question. I think the Carpentries is uh, it's in a very unique position where we have a more technical end where we have maintainers and the maintaining leadership group, um, which can get quite technical. They can get technical in how to write the lessons. Will it work when learners are, you know, um, actually taking it, how to make the website look better, stuff like that. But then we have, for instance, our trainers leadership, where uh, what they do is making sure that things run smoothly. We train individuals on up-to-date educational you know, resources and stuff. But this is very interesting. And I would like to hear from maybe from Jim and from Catherine, uh, how the more technical, non-technical kind of gets into that. Because I know our leadership committees are all run by community members and there's a core team liaison on them, you know, to show support and to see how we can connect the core team, which is the more formal structure and an informal structure of the leadership together. And um, I think it depends on the need of that group, how it's run, not necessarily in our instance, if it's technical or not. So um, thanks, Jim, for raising your hand. I would love to hear what you say. Oh, I didn't mean to slow you down by raising my hand. I was just ready to go next. Um, so uh, I want to just call out like the use of words, open infrastructure, and what Taj might mean by that when he poses the question might be really different from what a community member who's considering maybe stepping up in a leadership role thinks of what that word means. Um, and then the other part of the question is like, it sort of centers the organization, an organization that is more technical versus an organization that is maybe more social. And what those organizations do with respect to this notion of open infrastructure. So I want to kind of invert the question or adjust the question slightly. Instead, I think we should imagine that there's a collection of social innovations, like a code of conduct, 
or being intellectually generous or being leading with humility. And there's some technical inventions like the transistor that might enable us to work together in new ways and allow people to participate in science that have previously been excluded. So an analogy for me in the framing of the question. So back in the early 2000s, HTML5 was invented. It's the rage. You can do anything with HTML5. You've even got JavaScript. You can control the DOM. Look, you can do this. You can do that. If everybody could just speak HTML5, it would be this remarkable democratic world where people can express themselves with all of this new expressibility. But people were like, what do I do with this? If you're a web developer, maybe you know what to do. But if you just want to like share what happened yesterday, or if you want to share what you ate for breakfast this morning, HTML5 is too complex a design palette. So socially, what people did was they enabled a social innovation by constraining the technological palette by inventing WordPress or by inventing Facebook. And so by shaping the ways that people interact with technical infrastructure, it led them to see a way that they could participate and then they could share and do other things. But that process of constraining technology to orchestrate people's behavior enters into capitalism, power, stealing money from this group of people and putting it in the pockets of those other people. And so I think the real call to action for this audience is to recognize the privilege that I'm speaking from, to recognize the enablement and resources that I might be able to move forward and empower people to do things in a much more democratic, widely participatory way. Privilege gets in the way of my way of thinking, and I act in ways that often reify power without even knowing it. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, Katrin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, but a lot of it, I'm just going to say here, here to what uh, Jim just said. I think that was right on target. And the the interplay that, that Jim was calling attention to between technical and social infrastructure um, is always both held in tension. And when it's working well, those two things are complementary. Um, so that the social infrastructure is helping to shape the technical and the technical infrastructure is helping to shape the social. Um, in terms of roles of governance and, and how to create governance, governance is just decision making. I mean, at its base, that's what it means is who, how, where, and under what conditions are decisions made. Um, vesting communities with authority is something that we talk about doing a lot more than we actually do it. And so one of the things that um, that I both advise and, and certainly uh, try to encourage in the, the spaces that I'm working in is that we look very carefully at how decisions are made in, in our organizations. And if we don't have the communities actually in charge of decisions, then it's not right to call it community-led. So there's, there's this, uh, there's a way in which we use, I think we broadly, open science, open scholarship, we use the term community-led or community-governed um, to refer to a lot of both organizations and technical infrastructures that may or may not actually be community led or community governed. And it's dangerous. Um, there is nobody kind of, you know, reinforcing those, uh, those terms with audits to say, if you're not following this, then it doesn't work, but it's watered down what it means. And so when I think about governance and when I think about establishing community governance, the the most important components of that are figuring out who is the community who are all the stakeholders that have some vested interest in what the uh organization or the group or you know whatever form it may be taking 
um, what the community is, uh, who is a part of that. And then what decisions are critical for that infrastructure or group, or again, whatever the, the form is, what decisions are critical for maintaining the, uh, the direction, the vision, the uh, implementation? Uh, and are those decisions in the hands of community members or are they held by a, a small subset? And how is that small subset designated and how is it visible and how is it transparent? So wrapped up in this question about how community members can can create better, which I, I think is is one of the things that we're all always striving for. Like, how do I make a better leadership or governance system? Um, starting with who's your community, really excavating that, and making sure that you are including all of the different types of stakeholders that may be interacting with your community, and then how do you make sure that those voices are actually engaged in whatever decision-making processes are happening at the uh, the organization level or at the infrastructure level. And I think doing that helps to put in place the right kinds of, uh, you know, hopefully more equitable, uh, more thoughtful across lots of different perspectives, um, decision-making for these infrastructures that otherwise are gonna lean in one direction or another. So, yeah. Thank you, Catherine, and you? Thanks. Um, I really enjoyed listening to what you were saying there, Kath Catherine, um, and thinking about things like whether something is community-led or not, um, and whether that's something you want or not. Um, and it sort of gave me some reflection. Uh, for example, in OLS, we talk with the community a lot. We have a board drawn from our community, but the board doesn't have final say over what the leadership does. And we're very transparent about that. But at the end of the day, we that's not necessarily what we want. We want to work with the community, but that doesn't mean that the community gets the right the, the decisions all of the time. Um, I think we could, I could spend time thinking about that or justifying that right now, but, um, we only have half an hour left on the call. The other point that I wanted to make was that, um, the decisions that you make change depending on your role in the project. And you may end up being a, a leader in a technical, and when I say technical, I mean specifically code or computational infrastructure. Um, you, you may, through your coding, end up being asked to do leadership, uh, which I think speaks a bit to what, uh, Jim, you were saying, where you are a professor and then all of a sudden you are an entrepreneur, and Catherine, what you were saying about accidentally founding a nonprofit. Um, and... None of those were things that kind of were the, the skills that you needed to do the leadership weren't the skills that got you there in the first place, which is kind of weird. Um, but that is to say that there is a real chance that you and or community members may, may need to skill up in things that you didn't expect. Um, ask yourselves those questions uh, and figure out what it is that you don't know yet. Um, but chances are there are people who've done that before who are very willing to share what they have learned on the way of that. Oh, didn't know I needed that. Um, and someone, I can't even remember who, shared a really nice article about decision making pitfalls for technical leaders where you were a coder and then, hey, you're a good coder, be a team leader. Uh, comes in and you suddenly start making decisions that maybe don't make sense at the next level up, even though they made sense further down. Um, I think it's an interesting distinction, recognizing that you will need to change your skills if if you path if you climb that pathway. Um, thank you, you, um, Nicola. Do you want to add to that? Okay. Um, uh, I, I just want I, to add that, that that I don't have the slightest idea of what leadership is. I'm I'm just trying to to do the best I can 
to solve to solve this problem and and I, I don't feel like a leader I'm just doing what what is needed all the time uh, but but perhaps at some time I, I should be thinking about that because as the organization get bigger and bigger but but I don't know I don't even ask me that question um thank you everyone so one thing that um you have all mentioned is that it involves decision making. So my next question is on how do you make decisions in your organization? Now, thinking about things like license, what tools do you use for communication within your community? Like when different communities have different ways. So like, how do you come to those decisions of these are the tools that we are going to use for our communities, or these are the licenses that we're going to make our our work what how do you make those decisions i'm going to give two examples like take uh from a pad and notes those are simple decisions that might be different from organization to organization license some use cc by um sa some use cc by nc some use cc by 4.0 so kind of um you take decisions uh, as leaders that will impact the way your organization works so and then how do you make those decisions yes please you um i think figuring out who has the authority to make decisions makes sense uh, for example, if you are a young community and there's three of you working together, but only one of you has a lot of time to do stuff and the other two don't, the person who has a lot of time is probably the person who needs to have the authority to do that. Um, but also, sometimes having criteria or guiding principles that you work with can be very useful. Uh, so, for example, um, for me, the reason that I will always push using Etherpad over using Google Docs is because um, if someone with a screen reader tries to use Google Docs, they will have serious difficulty. Whereas Etherpad and Framapad, they are more friendly. And it means that I don't have to change anything for a blind person to work with me. Whereas if I make a, if I make a Google Doc, I have to wait for someone to complain. And that's rubbish. No one wants to have to have their first interaction with you be a complaint. Um, so like it, it might be that you have very different needs um, and I'm not saying that Etherpad is the only or the uh, correct way to do it, but recognizing what your goals are and using that as a decision making framework can be very helpful. And it means you have to justify what you're doing less because you can just say, oh, yeah, I went through that particular basic framework and that's how it ended up. Any other thoughts? Yes, please, Anjali. Thanks, I needed to quickly just check in our Google Drive because we have um, a two-part system. Uh, I want to say the first is a, a decision-making matrix, in a sense, different levels. And, and this ties up with Yo said about the different levels, uh, you know, who's consulted, who has ultimate power. And then after that, tracking the decisions we make very important right because a lot of times then you're gonna to have to go back to the minutes or recordings and reading through all that and that's a very interesting so we have the matrix of who what where why how and then we kind of just track that but i must say for the most part the community facing decisions are the communities consulted um, we have community surveys. I don't know. It depends on probably uh, what uh, the mission and vision of our organization is, right? But we work in a very global community and the needs and wants of a community, let's say in South Africa, might not be the same as a community in Australia. So I think we need to acknowledge that. And it makes our I wouldn't say that work more difficult, but definitely more complex. So um, I think that's where the matrix comes in. It makes it very easy. Um, I must say we had a ready set. 
which is an organization to help us set up uh, the matrix. So if you um, Google them, they might have a lot of resources that you can tap into for your, uh, you know, organization or your community. Um, thank you, Angelique. Jim, you have a hand up. Yeah, I like the question. Um, I want to just highlight that there are dragons and pitfalls in answering this question. So on the one hand, it might be really obvious. Well, we should use a very tightly constrained license that prevents any kind of commercial harvesting of our great ideas, as opposed to a very lax license that allows for future commercial usage. Depending on the proclivities of the decision makers that are choosing the license, at the time when you make this decision, you might be in a sort of values vibe that you think, oh, we have to tighten this off and prevent any commercial usage. But that's sort of like going out to go surfing and choosing not to catch a wave. Because if there is like a big lift and suddenly there's a bunch of commercial interest or there's alignment of commercial interests with what you're building, then you might be able to benefit from a massive change that is being driven by others. I'm a huge fan of Fernando Perez and his creation of the IPython notebook and then the generalization to become Jupiter. And Fernando, young Fernando, when he made this remarkable invention was very fortunate because his idea was to move the things that we interact with in the terminal into the browser so that you can do uh, scientific storytelling using all of the expressibility of JavaScript. So you can use mathematical notation, you can embed images, but previously you couldn't do that if you were working just in the terminal alone. So Fernando was fortunate because there was massive investment from all kinds of commercial entities in creating JavaScript and creating the browser in embellishing the browser with all of this enriched expressibility. And so he leaned into these commercial um, waves in order to make Jupiter work. In doing so, he and the others that contributed to this chose a very flexible open license that allows for commercial participation and academic participation. Contrast that with, say, the Open Software Foundation, which uses GPL, which sometimes ends up creating barriers for ongoing use and participation. It has its role, but it may not have the same lift and impact. So it's not so obvious sometimes what license to use. And so I appreciate the question as something that is really important in governance and defining how a community should interact with openness. Um, thank you, Jim. Catherine or Nicholas, anyone wants to add? Okay, so I would open the floor to questions from the communities. Here, if you have any question, if you want to add that in the chat or the document or speak it out, uh, please do. I do have other questions that I can continue with, but I think based on the time, it's good to give everyone the opportunity to add to their question. Um, yes, please, Raven. Uh, yes, just a comment. I don't have a question. Uh, uh, this comment is going to Nicholas Wolowick. I, I always believe that uh, within us, we always have some leadership skills. Uh, and at some point in life, uh, you'll be regarded as a leader. So my recommendation is at least go look at uh, Steve, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Leadership. I think you'll get some something from his articles. Thank you. Um, thank you, Braven. Thank you. And... Thank you, Braven. Yes, so any question um, or comment from the participant?
So let me ask another question in terms of decision making as well. So we have different uh, organizations and the way they interact with their communities differ. But then what should be the influence of the community in the decision making process? So for example, the catalyst uh, project, if you think of that, so for the different decisions that we make in organizations, how do we receive feedback or how do we, like what Angelique mentioned in terms of having different um, community led. So how is the feedback process or how do you incorporate that into the, the, the decision making process? Obviously you are going to have a lot of decisions then you have to think about what to take. So what is the process for, for that? And then how effective has that been? Um, yes, please, Jill. Uh, so I'm going to try and suggest, like, uh, respond to this one. Try and be aware of your expertise and be aware of your lack of expertise. Uh, so, for example, I feel confident about uh, offering someone a contract these days because I've been doing it for a while. Um, and I probably wouldn't take the advice of someone outside of the UK when it came to employment law because they might not be in the same uh, level of expertise. Um, if they were, that would be another thing, of course. Um, but if I have someone from my community uh, who knows more about their circumstance than I do, I shouldn't be telling them they're wrong. Um, and a very important part of this might be uh, something like uh, let's say the micro grants that we have for participation in these cohort calls. I've never ever been, uh, I've never lived in Nigeria and I don't know how much someone's internet costs um, or whether they really, really need it. So I'm going to trust that they know what they need much more than I know what I need. Um, so that would be uh, trust people when they're the ones who are the experts is the, what I'd say when possible. Uh, thank you, you. So, Catherine? I think Jim had his hand up first. Let him go ahead. Ah, uh, you go ahead first. I'll follow you. All right. Okay. So, I, I just have a specific example where I think this question is playing out in Catalyst. So, uh, together with the other partners, uh, 2I2C led the creation of a proposal that went to Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for funding. This proposal had this idea. We're going to use cloud, commercial cloud delivery of interactive computing platforms to help communities in Latin America and Africa do open science. So implicit in that is the way to do this is with commercial cloud. And that was funded. So now we're constrained within the current project. This is the way we're going to experiment with trying to catalyze open science communities. And that way uses commercial cloud. But Nicola and others in Latin America have expressed, and in Africa, have expressed concern. A long tail running of this service requires that dollars flow from Latin America and Africa to Amazon or to Google or to Microsoft. And that's potentially unsustainable and also may potentially be in great conflict with other regional goals. But we came with constraints. We came with an opportunity because we didn't consult on the front end to create the right structure. So what do we do? Well, we can't throw everything out because we have promises to the grant maker, we have promises to Chan Zuckerberg that we're gonna to try to run this, but we wanna to try to shape a future state that is actually more about open science than about the delivery of revenue to Amazon or Google or Microsoft. So in back channels with Nicola today, I'm trying to find a way, can we break free of the reliance upon commercial cloud to find a different way to deliver the technical infrastructure to enable a sustaining of 
the good progress that we've started. So sometimes this feedback that Taj highlights can instantly allow for change, but other times there's constraints that have been uh, defined by previous decisions and we have to navigate within those constraints. Thank you, Jim. That's that's a very good example. Um, Catherine? Yeah, that, that was beautifully said, Jim, and probably much more uh, circumspect than the way I would have said it. Um, and I was thinking along the same lines, it's one of the challenges that I think is here for this project, but is also here for a lot of projects and maybe for a lot of CZI funded projects um, because CZI is trying to fund in lower and middle income uh, locations and you know economies and it it's a uh, you can't do that effectively you can't do that as effectively without having established partnerships and established knowledge but you can't build the knowledge without the projects and so there's this kind of catch-22 in the equation that um you know, for for me, I inherited this project to some degree within IOI. I wasn't part of the grant making team. Um, I came in right after I think this had been awarded. And I can remember, Jim, in the earliest part of my work, what we were doing was interviewing all of the first, all of the core partners. So the the set of grant partners. And in the process of those interviews, I learned exactly what you just said, that that the cloud part was problematic at its core unless you were helping to set up cloud infrastructures in countries that could not afford and did not want to afford Amazon or other uh, options that needed to have more control over the uh, infrastructure that they're relying on. Um, the amount of time it took to get from that point A of, oh shit, we've got a problem at the base of this project that may not impact all partners, but certainly is going to impact some. And that uh, that may be something that there are creative ways to approach that we're not thinking of right now. But as Jim said, we already had a game plan. We already had the project. And so in some ways, this project has been about learning the things that we needed to know at the start of the project so that in follow-on work, hopefully we can do a better job. But it is this you know, really complicated space because you're trust building in the process of inviting partners into a project. And if that trust is broken before the project even gets off the ground, even if it's because of assumptions that were made before the grant was awarded, you know, on the one hand, the grant enables the communication, the partnership, all the rest, but it also enables these uh, discord uh, moments that I wish part of what grant projects would allow um, and unfortunately they don't, and there are reasons why they don't. I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, it, this is not an easy problem to solve, but there needs to be a period at the start of a grant where you're funded to talk to each other and just talk to each other and figure out whether you've got some fundamental flaws that are there in your project plan that you couldn't spot at the time that you were applying for the project. And sometimes that's going to be because the partners have never worked together before and they need to build that relationship and need that time to actually do that work of learning what they don't know about each other. Sometimes it's going to be that something else in the landscape, when you think about how long it takes to get a project funded, we've had situations where we land a grant. Yay! Well, we started writing that grant three years ago. And by the time that it actually got funded, there were six other things that we would rather be spending our time doing. And there is no way to go back to the funder who's finally engaged with the thing that you were trying to propose three years ago and say, oh, wait, wait, the, the landscape has changed. There are actually these critical things that we need to change about our project. 
doing that risks losing the funding. Um, and so there's this there's this interesting uh, space at the front of a project that instead of carving that out deliberately and making that a part of the project, the first project becomes that. And I think that that's loaded. And so in some ways, what we've done in this Catalyst project has been bringing together first six organizations that had never worked together before, collaborating to try to make the, uh, the cloud uh, infrastructure more available for Jupiter Hub and other things in in uh, Africa and in Latin America. Most of us didn't know all the ins and outs of that starting off. We didn't know each other. Um, so there was that. And then there was the inviting in of the community partners, which is another layer. And so there'd been two really important trust building moments that had to happen within the project, but weren't actually part of the scope of the project. And nor do most funders see that as something that you would need to build in or even be welcome to build in as fundable work. Um, and I think that's a space where we need to, there, there probably is some writing that this team needs to get out based on some of the things that we've experienced in this project to at least start conversations in the, the wider uh, field about how how to make that kind of recursive moment at the beginning of a project richer and more inclusive um, in projects that again are supposed to be community focused and community oriented. Um, thank you, Catherine. We have about seven minutes. Actually, one of the questions I really wanted to ask was. For example, in the Catalyst project, there you have different organizations coming together. How do you think of alignment in terms of the tools and infrastructure to use? But there we have limited time, and I think Catherine um, touched on some of that. So my final question um, is, let me put that in the chat. What advice would you give to our community partners about applying open leadership? principles in their projects slash communities. I will give one minute each so that we can finish before the half hour mark. Who wants to go first? Um, Angelic, please. Thanks so much. I think I'm going to keep it sweet and short. I think listen and talk to each other. Sit down, listen, like really listen. You know, just give one hour where everyone just talks and you record and you can look at the notes later. Just listen and talk. Thank you very much. Um, your please. My advice would be iterate. You're not going to get it right the first time, um, but you're going to go and doing your best. Uh, don't wait for it to be perfect. Do what you have to do in the time that you have. But learn when you make mistakes, because you will make mistakes. But so long as you're okay with that, um, and you're thoughtful about how you handle it, and you learn from that, keep on doing, keep on improving. Um, thank you, Mio. Who wants to go next? I'm happy to go next. Um, I think one of the things... practiced before I realized the importance of it is transparency. Be as transparent and as open as you can be. There are definitely times when you can't be, but be as transparent and as open and as trustworthy as you possibly can be um, in working with other people. Share, share your story, share what's happening. Uh, it makes so much of a difference in the success of relationships, which is ultimately what the success of technology and projects rest on. Um, thank you, Catherine. Jim? I'll make a comment. Um, so leadership is, I think, a confusing term because it comes with this expectation that you're the expert. Uh, it comes with all of this pejorative hierarchy boss is sometimes evoked when you hear the word leader 
But I think open leadership is a different kind of call to action. So you don't have to be the expert or the gray haired person standing on top of the box, telling everyone else to behave a certain way. It's much more, I think, and I'm trying to learn how to do this because I was, I think, trained in this other model of leadership. I think it's much more about asking questions, listening, shaping what you hear, and then finding the common threads of what a group of people want to do and helping to move that group of people, co-creating co momentum in a direction that you all kind of agree to move toward. And in this way, it is much more generous and respectful of the people that you are seeking to collaborate with than I think the general military org chart, hierarchical, pejorative leadership that I often imagine when I hear it. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, Nicola? Uh, for me, empathy. You have to, to respect the other, understand the culture. It's, it's a problem of, of understanding and culture. And uh, the other the other things just go on, and of course a clear vision. Too. <laughs> you, you have to know where to go. <laughs> At least you have to be convinced that that there is a way. The rest is is. I think that the rest is is just working on that. I think. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um... This for me has been great learning more about you all. We have been on this project for over a year and a half, but I'm learning more about every one of you, which is really interesting and your journey. Um, I We do have one minute, so I'm not sure if anyone from the participants would like to comment or... I just typed it in the chat, but I want to thank Taj for bringing us together and serving as the moderator. Thank you all. Thank you very much. This has been great. So I would stop recording. Thank you all for joining into this session.